This is going to be a lesson on when the serpent strikes. Now, the devil knows he can't get you lost. He knows you can't lose your salvation. He knows you're lo no longer his child. So he knows he doesn't have you anymore. But he's going to spend the rest of your life trying to get your flesh. And to get you serving him and doing what he wants you to do. And he's going to strike at you. He's a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. And I want to give you some examples of what you can do when the serpent strikes or before the serpent strikes. First, I want you to turn to 1 Samuel 16, 14 through 23. 1 Samuel 16, 14. And this is a story about King Saul and young David. And it says in 1 Samuel 16, 14, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. You're going to have an evil spirit that troubles you. Just because you're saved doesn't mean you're not going to have evil spirits, unclean spirits, uh, harassing you, bothering you, troubling you. And Saul's servant said unto him, Behold now, an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. Let our Lord now command thy servants, which are before thee, to seek out a man who is a cunning player on an harp. And it shall come to pass, when the evil spirit from God is upon thee, that he shall play with his hand, and thou shalt be well. And Saul said unto his servants, Provide me now a man that can play well, and bring him to me. Then answered one of the servants, and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, that is cunning in playing, and a mighty, valiant man, and a man of war, and prudent in matters, and a comely person, and the Lord is with him. Wherefore, Saul sent messengers unto Jesse, and said, Send me David thy son, which is with the sheep. And Jesse took an ass laden with bread, and a bottle of wine, and a kid, and sent them by David his son unto Saul. And David came to Saul, and stood before him, and he loved him greatly, and he became his armor-bearer. And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David, I pray thee, stand before me, for he hath found favor in my sight. And it came to pass, when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David took an harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. So after hearing David play on the harp, he was refreshed, he was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. This shows me that one of the things to do when the serpent strikes, or before the serpent strikes, is get a spiritual kind of music. You need to get a spiritual kind of music. Just like Saul got somebody who the Lord was with. It said the Lord was with David and 1 Samuel 16, 18, and he played on a harp, and the evil spirit departed from him. Now look at Ephesians 5, 19 real quick. Ephesians 5, 19 says, Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Look at Colossians 3, 16. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. When you're listening to music, are you listening to psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, and is it causing you to sing with grace in your hearts to the Lord? You, you need to make sure you got the right kind of music. Now turn to a few more places here. Look at 2 Kings 3. 2 Kings 3, 14 through 15. 
It says, And Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts liveth, before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look toward thee, nor see thee, but now bring me a minstrel. And it came to pass, when the minstrel played, that the hand of the Lord came upon him. And he said, Thus saith the Lord, Make this valley full of dishes, ditches. For thus saith the Lord, Ye shall not see wind, neither shall ye see rain. Yet that valley shall be filled with water, but ye may drink both ye and your cattle and your beasts. You see, he had somebody, a minstrel play. He had somebody play on an instrument, a spiritual kind of music. And the hand of the Lord came up on him, and he started preaching. Now, possibly that's where you get singing before the preaching in church. And it makes the unclean spirits scatter a little bit. And you're teaching and admonishing one another with these psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Now, turn to Second Chronicles 29.30. Second Chronicles... 29 and verse 30 it says moreover hezekiah the king and the princes commanded the levites to sing praise unto the lord with the words of david and of asaph the seer and they sang praises with gladness and they bowed their heads and worshiped so you see there's a spiritual kind of music and when you're tempted when the serpent strikes, you know what you can do? Put on some godly music. Put on some spiritual kind of music. And it can help drive off the unclean spirits. And it can help beat down the flesh. You get godly songs in your heart. Not these songs of the world. You need to get the godly songs in your heart and in your kid's heart. You see, there's a lot of, there's a bad kind of music. Like Daniel 3, 5, when Nebuchadnezzar played the music and they fell down and worshipped the image. Like in Exodus 32, 17 through 19, where uh, Moses and Joshua was coming down off the mount and they heard that noise. And um, Joshua was like, this, is, this sounds like war. But Moses is like, no, this is, this is people dancing. This is people singing. See, that music, it sounded like war. It didn't sound like it didn't sound right. But you see, there's a song of fools the Bible talks about. In your temptation, the song of fools will only make things worse. And you're going to have to get some spiritual kind of music. You're walking around with all this worldly music in your heart. How are you going to beat the temptation when the serpent strikes if you're walking around with Taylor Swift music in your heart? Hearing her sing about uh, her long list of ex-lovers. How are you going to beat the temptation with that on your mind and in your heart? How are you going to beat the temptation when you're walking around with... Uh, I, I don't even know, a famous singer today. But all the filth that it talks about. How are you going to walk around with that on your heart and expect to beat the serpent when he strikes you know, the, most music, it's, got, it's just full of lustful things, sexual things. And then when you listen to that, you're getting that in your heart. And in your mind, plays that song back over. The country music, what's it all about? Getting drunk. Getting revenge. And you get that in your heart, that's what's going to be in your heart. When the serpent strikes, you don't have that spiritual kind of music. You know, just putting on some psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, just putting on a spiritual kind of music will drive unclean spirits away. You know, you can listen to it on your way to work. You can listen to it while you're at work. Just have it playing in the background at home. You know, you maybe you got this pet sin that you're struggling with, but then you got, a song going in the background like are you washed in the blood are you washed in the blood of the lamb it's going to be a lot harder to do that pet sin when you got are you washed in the blood playing in the background 
You see, you need to get some spiritual kind of music. Just like Saul, a wicked man, but he got some spiritual kind of music. And it helped drive those unclean spirits away. Elijah got some spiritual kind of music. And the hand of the Lord came upon him. Now, a spiritual kind of music, it's not going to... It's not going to help every time. And it can't be the only thing that you do to drive off temptation. Over in 1 Samuel 18, 10 through 12, they tried the same thing with Saul, but look what happens. And it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied in the midst of the house, and David played with his hand, as at other times, and there was a javelin in Saul's hand. And Saul cast the javelin, for he said, I will smite David even to the wall with it. And David avoided out of his presence twice. And Saul was afraid of David, because the Lord was with him, and was departed from Saul. So you see, it wasn't a foolproof thing. David did the same thing he did the other time. He played with his hand. He played some spiritual kind of music. But the unclean spirit stayed with Saul. Ends up trying to kill David. So it's not foolproof. But you do. You need to get a spiritual kind of music. But you need a more foolproof thing. You need to get scripture from your memory. Look at Matthew 4, 1 through 11. When the serpent strikes, you need to have so much scripture in your memory that all you got to do is pull out a verse of scripture and quote it. Now look at Matthew 4, 1 through 11. It says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. So Jesus Christ is going to be out there in the wilderness with that serpent striking at him for 40 days and 40 nights. And it says, And when he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. So you see that? The, the serpent striking at him. And he says, Command that these stones be made bread. Well, the devil always wants you to do what the flesh wants to do. And he's got the nerve to ask Jesus Christ, the bread of life himself. Jesus Christ, the rock of ages, the stone of stumbling, the rock of offense, the stone cut without hands. He's got the nerve to ask him to turn the stones into bread. Well, Jesus Christ is the stone. Jesus Christ is the rock. Jesus Christ is the bread of life. He could easily turn the stones into bread. And, you know, turning the stones into bread wouldn't be a bad thing. The bad thing about it is it would have been bad because the devil told him to do it. And it wasn't at a, the time he was supposed to do it. But the devil always wants you to do what the flesh wants you to do. Now, Jesus Christ is fully God. But when he was walking this earth, he was... He became flesh. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. 1 Timothy 3.16 And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. In the flesh, Jesus Christ was starving. He had just fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. He was hungry. He would have, you know, his flesh would have loved to turn the stones into bread and ate it to satisfy the hunger of the flesh. God doesn't get hungry, but as man, he got hungry. God doesn't get tired, but as man, he got tired. And the devil wanted him to do what the flesh wanted to do. But what does the Lord do? Not what the devil wants. You know, Job said in 23.12, I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. You know, the word of God is more important than what the flesh is wanting. And when it comes down to it, Jesus is all you need. The Lord Jesus Christ and the Word, the living Word and the written Word is all you need. And He's the water of life. He's the bread of life. You know, the Word of God is like milk. 1 Peter 2, 2, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. It is meat. 
Hebrews 5.14, you know, the Bible talks about strong meat when it comes, it comes to the Word of God. You see, you don't need the thing that you're tempted with. You don't need it. But you need Jesus Christ and you need the Word of God. The temptation can be a good thing at the wrong time as well. But Jesus Christ, He lived by every Word of God. You know what He says? You know what He does to the devil? You know what he does when the serpent strikes? He doesn't turn the stones into bread. But Matthew 4, 4 says, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So when you're tempted, you say, It is written. You got your scriptural, music, your spiritual music on in the background. You got that new song in your heart. Not this new wicked stuff that everybody's loving, the Taylor Swift stuff. You're not a Swifty. You're a Christian, and you got spiritual music playing, and you got scripture in your memory. And you're going to say, it is written. You have to get the word in you to say that. It is written. Jesus said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Jesus Christ lived by every word of God. He got scripture from his memory when the serpent striked. Then the devil's still not done. Matthew 4, 5, and 6 says, Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. So the devil is bringing him up to the pinnacle of the temple and tells him to cast himself down because, you know, the angels will, will bear him up. You know, if you're the son of God, Jesus, then do it. But think about this. He's bringing Jesus Christ, who is the temple, on, on to the pinnacle of the temple. See, Jesus Christ, you know, he, uh, they tried to show him that temple. And he said, let me tell you what he said. I'm going to turn to it, make sure I get it right. And, and John 2, 19, John 2, 18, Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What son showest thou unto us, seeing that thou do these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and I will... Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. You see, Jesus Christ is the real temple. Jesus Christ is the temple that really means something. And he, the devil brings him to the pinnacle of the temple. The devil try to tempt him, tries to tempt him with turning stones into bread. Well, he is the stone. He is the bread. He is the temple. But the devil brings him to the pinnacle of the temple. And you see, the devil's trying to tempt him with all the same stuff he tempts us with. You know, this temptation here, it's about the pride of life. Don't let pride get in the way of declining the temptation. Don't let pride get in the way when the serpent strikes because... He'll bite you. He'll get his venom in you. Jesus Christ was the temple. Jesus Christ didn't even need to do anything that the devil had to offer. So you know what he does? It says in Matthew 4, 7, Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And that was like a blow to the face of the devil. Jesus Christ showing him, I am the Son of God. I'm God manifest in the flesh. And thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Jesus just pulls another scripture from memory. You got to get the scripture in your memory. Now look at what the devil does next. That he Look at what he has the nerve to say next. In Matthew 4, 8, it says, Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And saith unto him, 
All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Imagine the nerve of the devil to look at Jesus Christ in the face and tell him that all these things I'll give thee if you fall down and worship me. Does he not realize in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God the same as in the beginning with God all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made? You see, he says, all these things will I give thee. But the only reason the devil has power to give the kingdoms to anybody is because God himself gave him that power. He's looking in the face of the person that gave him that power. The devil was offering Jesus the kingdoms temporarily, just for a temporary time. But it was at a sooner time. You see, the devil will offer you temporary pleasure at a sooner date. You see, Jesus Christ knew he'd be getting the kingdoms later, but it wouldn't be temporary when he got them. It would be eternally. So the devil is tempting you with the temporary, instant satisfaction, pleasure at a sooner date. You know, you could go out and have instant, temporary pleasure right now. But God has eternal rewards for you if you'll endure temptation with patience. When the serpent strikes, you got to turn it down. you got to turn down the pleasurable thing that he's tempting you with. And you get a reward for it, but at a later date. You'll get satisfaction for it, but at a later date. James 1.12, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. So you know what the Lord Jesus Christ does when the devil says, this other stupid thing here. He says in Matthew 4.10, Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Jesus Christ just pulls out another scripture from memory and says, Get thee hence. And you see, he can rebuke him because he's the Lord. He he cast the devils out with his presence. And just as he will do permanently at the end of the 1,000 year reign, he'll say, get thee hence, Satan. You see, you got to get a spiritual kind of music. You got to get scripture for your memory. Now, these things won't completely get rid of your temptations. They're not going to completely get the devil out of your life. But I guarantee you, if you start right now, replace all your swifty music with spiritual music. Replace all your wicked hobbies with scripture. You're going to put a dent, a huge dent in your temptation life. Now here's another one. Get started calling for your master. You need to go ahead and get started. Look at what... Michael the archangel does when the serpent is striking. It says, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. He just got his master to rebuke the serpent. Look at Zechariah 3, 1 through 2, and the angel of the Lord himself is showing you a pattern of what you need to do. When the serpent strikes, Zechariah 3, 1 through 2, And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuked thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuked thee. You see that? The Lord's giving you the example that the Lord himself has to be the one to rebuke the devil. When you got the serpent striking you, you got to get started calling for your master to help you. Look at Matthew 26, 41. In Matthew 26, 41, it says, Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. 
The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. You're going to have to get started praying that you enter not into temptation. The flesh is so weak, and the devil knows it. you got to pray that you won't enter into temptation. Here's some things to pray. 1 Corinthians 10.13. Look at that. In 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13, it says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. You see, there is a way of escape. You gotta go, you gotta pray for that exit sign to become more visible. That's what you need to pray. There's something you can pray to the master. Get started calling on your master for a quick exit sign over to the side. You know how when you were young and maybe you were out with some friends and they were doing something they weren't supposed to be doing and your heart just sinks and you you know you're not supposed to be here and you're scared to death and then you just, well, back in the day they had pay phones and stuff. You could just get on the pay phone or when I was in high school, they just started coming out with cell phones. I, I got me, uh, didn't have an iPhone yet, but I had a flip phone. And you could just call your parents, your grandparents, and say, come get me. And then that feeling of relief when your parents got there and got you out of that situation. That's what it's like. Get started calling for the master. Look at 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 9. Look at what Paul was dealing with. Paul says, Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in meekness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So you see, Paul had a messenger of Satan bugging him, and it was to keep him humble. But he besought the Lord about it. you got to beseech the Lord about this. Get started calling for master. And the last one I'm not going to talk much about because it's just obvious. You need to get situated on your maker's side. You need to be on the Lord's side. Through all this temptation, through all the things that go on in this life, you, you might end up getting bitter and be pushed to the other side. You got to get situated on your maker's side. Just like Job, no matter the temptation he went through, no matter the trial he went through, Job 1.20, Then Job arose and ruined his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. You see, when the serpent strikes, you got to trust God. You gotta still give God glory. And in Job two, nine through ten, the devil showed up in the mouth of Job's wife, and look what happens. Job two nine. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. The devil got into Job's wife and told him to curse God and die. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What, shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? And all this did not Job sin with his lips. You see, the devil's going to do everything he can. He's going to strike you from every way. That's why you got to work, walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. You got to work, walk circumspectly. You are the hunted. You're not just the hunter. You're the hunted. And that roaring lion is hunting you. That serpent is striking at you, but you got to get a spiritual kind of music. I'm telling you, 
get rid of the wicked music, put on some spiritual kind of music, and you get those songs in your heart, it's going to be a lot harder to sin when you got How Great Thou Art in the background. Are you washed in the blood in the background? There's power in the blood in the background. It's going to be a lot harder to sin when you got that in the background. You got to get scripture from your memory. It's going to be a lot harder for the devil to get you to do what he wants you to do when you're quoting them scriptures and saying, It is written. It is written. It's going to be a lot harder to give in to sin when the moment you're tempted, you get started calling for your master and getting situated by the maker's side. So that's just a few things to do when the serpent strikes.